Well, good morning on this Sunday morning, the 12th of September. Um, I'm not quite sure what to say for chit chat. This week has not been that different from <laughs> the weeks before, except that our case numbers in Victoria have been rising and those in New South Wales have been rising too. And um, I'm, yeah, people are saying, well, what more can we do? So we just hope that our vaccinations will soon catch up with our COVID cases and easier days might be ahead for everyone. In Melbourne, as you know, those of you who are not here, it is spring and it's lovely. And if you have your own garden, then spring is certainly easier and more pleasant in lockdown is, is more pleasant in spring than in the middle of winter. Um, yes, of course, um, lots of Afghani refugees now being welcomed into our communities and cared for, as should be. And we've managed to rescue some more who made it into Pakistan. So the work goes on. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll hand over to Graham. Well, I add my welcome to Christine, uh, Christine's welcome, and uh, so nice to have you tuning in with us. It's uh, be lonely without you. Uh, we're going to begin our service with prayer, so shall we join together, unite our hearts in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you that you encourage us uh, to draw near, to focus upon you and think about you as you've been revealed in the person of the Lord Jesus. And we ask that as we do this, we will know that you have drawn near to us and that you will guide and strengthen us for the week ahead. We thank you that around the world today, Christian people are offering you their worship and adoration, even in the midst of a pandemic that has imposed restrictions on us, such as Christine has already alluded to. So, Father, be near us in this hour and speak to us through the music, through the stories we consider and the scriptures we draw on. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Christine is going to bring us young at heart. Thank you, Christine. Well, as sometimes happens, I had one theme in mind for this week, and then another theme suddenly jumped up. Um, so I'm really t I'm talking about the Paralympics. When our youngest ch grandchild was born in 2016, I was particularly re relieved to learn and to see that she was totally normal. The reason for one, one is always grateful for a healthy, normal baby. One is always grateful for a baby. But I was particularly concerned this time as our daughter, five years ago, was the exact same age my mother was when my brother was born with Downs. The Sunday after Holly was born, I was talking to the same member of the congregation I mentioned last week, whose um, husband was in the Australian Navy. And she said, I will never forget it. Oh, that wonderful world word, normal. That wonderful word, normal. Last week, we watched Rising Phoenix. It's an excellent Netflix documentary. So any of you have Netflix, and if you have time, I would recommend it. It's really the history of the Paralympics. This history begins with the man in the photograph, I think, yes, called Ludwig Gutmann, eventually to become Sir Ludwig. He was a neurosurgeon working in Germany until Kristallnacht made clear that Jews were no longer safe. And if any of the younger people don't know about Kristallnacht, there is plenty information about it on the internet. 
As soon as their ship docked in England, and I meant to check where they docked, but I didn't, Ludwig and his family were overwhelmed by the kindness they encountered. A sailor came up the gangplank and said, you should disembark first. Your children should not be left standing in a draft. The contra contrast with Kristallnacht and people who would not allow your children to stand in a draft could not have been more stark. As a neurologist, Ludwig was very busy helping wounded soldiers during and after the Second World War. Many of his fellow doctors thought that the very seriously wounded soldiers should be just given morphine or should be given morphine to ease their pain and allowed to die. Ludwig believed in the possibility of their recovery. He realized that if patients were turned every two hours, they were much less likely to develop bed sores, which can lead to infections, which could become fatal. His daughter on this documentary speaks so fondly of her father and how she forgave him the fact that she hardly ever saw him. She knew he was helping people and she has herself been honoured, not with a title, but with an OBE, for her voluntary work amongst the disabled. Ludwig realised that sport was an important way for men and women to regain the will to live, something we hear Paralympians saying again and again. In 1948, at the Stoke Mandeville Hospital, where many ex-service men and women were being treated, Ludwig organised the Stoke Mandeville Games on the 29th of July 1948 to coincide with the London Olympics opening the same day. This was a small affair but very significant. The Stoke Mandeville Games involved 16 injured servicemen and women who took part in archery. And I think, do we have a photo showing the archery? Yes. Yes. It took many years though, and much effort on the part of dedicated people in large, large numbers across the world for what we now know as the Paralympic Games to be established. And I suppose you all know, but I only found out, that para means alongside, as in parallel. So it's not the fact that some Paralympians are paraplegic, it's because they run alongside the Olympic Games. So the first year of the Paralympics was 1960 in Rome. Since then, they've had a rough ride. It's hard to believe, perhaps, when you see what happened, you know, how brilliantly they went this year in Japan. But in 1980, Russia was hosting the Olympic Games, but refused to host Paralympic Games. Brezhnev boldly said, we have no disabled people. Believe that one. Thankfully, Holland, maybe with typical Dutch generosity, stepped into the breach and the Paralympic Games in 1980 took place in Arnhem. Remember the date and the place. In 2016, much more recently, the organizing committee in Rio, just a few weeks out from the game, out from the Games admitted that they had used up Paralympic funds for the Olympic Games and they didn't have enough money to run the Paralympics. This caused anger, distress and panic, but the Games went ahead initially 
to very empty stadiums, stadia, is it? But um, by the end, absolutely full, with very, very loudly appreciative audiences. Now, Rising Phoenix, this Netflix documentary, has amazing footage of many Paralympic events, much of which I'd never seen before. It also features the lives and achievements of nine Paralympians from all over the world. I'm not going through any of them in detail. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I do encourage you to watch this. Oh, forgotten how her name is pronounced. I think it's Suize was a disabled girl from a poor family in China. Thankfully for her, the Chinese government, when they were hosting the Beijing Olympics, felt constrained to use the Paralympics to showcase their provision for Sui and other people with disabilities. So her life was absolutely transformed. Jean-Baptiste Alès, now living in France, was born in 1991, just before the civil war in Burundi. He was attacked with a machete when he was three. He came to France or went to France for a prosthesis in 1996 and stayed on. Our own Ellie Cole, who I can't say her name without a smile. She is a delightful person. Her can cancer meant that as a young child, her right leg had to be amputated below the knee. A terrible decision. Her parents had to give permission for that or allow her to die. On her first day of high school, Ellie was verbally bullied. She took her prosthetic leg, threw it across the room, hit the bully, and she was never bullied again. Now, I hasten to add, none of us, and I'm sure Ellie's parents, would never have recommended that strategy, but it was an effective one. Riley Batt, also Australian, he was born, I think, without legs or maybe with stubs. And his grandfather played an amazing role. I'm sure his parents did too. But his father first got him on wheels. You'll see how when you watch the deck documentary, if you can. And he says that the Paralympics brought him back to physical and mental health when he was in a very dark place. The other five stories are equally inspiring. Check them out. And even for those who don't have Netflix, if you look up the story of Tatiana McFadden on the internet, stories such as the Paralympics remind us that hard times can lead to better and brighter days. Love and healing in its various forms can grow from the blackest of situations. Sir Ludwig Gutman died in 1980, just three months before the Paralympics began in Arnhem, in Holland. There was a minute silence to honour him at the start of those games. What a turnaround when you think he could have lost his life if he had stayed in Germany. When we hit hard times, as we all do at times, May we remember that out of, our good, out of our difficulties, good may well come. And as Christians, let us claim the promise of Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that God will make all things work together for our good. May he bless us all and bless the work of the Paralympics and all who help people with disabilities. Thank you, Christine. It was an amazing story and we loved watching it. And I'm sure if you manage to look it up and see it yourself, you'll find it truly inspiring. Uh, now Amanda is going to bring us the scripture reading for today. Thank you, Amanda. Good morning, everyone. I'm reading from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. 
from the New International Version of the Bible. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Jesus Christ and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for that reading, Amanda. And uh, may God bless it to all of us as we think about it now for a few minutes. You would have picked up, I hope, the reference to... Uh, Winning the prize, striving to win the prize. I used this image from the Paralympic Games. Uh, it was one of the very impressive images, and I'll explain it a bit more later. But right at the heart of our reading, there's this idea of driving forward. And uh, we need to think about, uh, as the Apostle Paul suggests, what an athlete does to, to get forward. And the title I've given our, our talk is... A familiar phrase, which one hears again and again when you have small children, uh, but uh, once that passes, it seems to drop out of your life for quite a while. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And I want to suggest to you that the apostle is suggesting to us that uh, the answer is no, but we've got to be so, there's so much to be getting on with. So... So as we look at this passage, I want to think about it. Remember last week we looked at the, the song or the hymn, the uh, lyricism that's locked in at the beginning of chapter 2. Uh, it talks about Christ foregoing all the privileges and prerogatives of deity and stepping down and down and down until as a human being he, he became a servant human being. He came to serve. And to give his life, as he says in uh, Mark 10, 45, to give his life a ransom for many. And so it is that uh, th this great uh, song at the heart of the Christian faith causes joy and rejoicing. But there are dangers. There are dangers that the Philippians need to be reminded of 
And he's, he's going to point those out as well. He says, we have no confidence in the flesh. Uh, that is, uh, in, in things that we might have thought would have been in our favor, things that we might credit ourselves with. So I've got four headings that I want to use to be keys into different parts of what has been read to us today. The first heading is a pedigree rejected. The second is a priceless experience. The third is the pursuit of Christ. And then finally, prized by Christ. So four ideas in this short space of time. And uh, I won't dwell on them equally for the same amount of time. I, I don't want to give them equal weight today. But I want to begin with a pedigree rejected. And we know what the pedigree is. Here it is. If someone, says the apostle, if someone else thinks that they have reason to boast or to put confidence in the flesh, he says, I have more. Uh, I was circumcised on the eighth day, as all Jewish males were. He was of the people of Israel and of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, a Hebrew, he says, of the Hebrews. Uh, in regard to the law, he was a Pharisee. He, 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 was, he uh, outdid the uh, ordinary man in the street, as it were. He was one of a, an estimated number of around 3,000 at the time of Jesus, of people who, throughout the community who practiced very strictly observing the law. And, uh, and, and so he ended up being a persecutor of the Christians. Uh, that's how zealous he was. Uh, as far as righteousness based on the law, uh, he was faultless. Now, how did he feel about that? Well, he says, all that he boasted about, he now regards as worth and worthless. It was a stumbling block to him. The actual word he uses, you see it when you take a dog for a walk. You know, clean up after your dog, it says at the park. And so you see people put their hands inside plastic bags and pick up something that's so revolting that they want to get rid of it as soon as they can. And that's what the apostle says. Uh, he, can, he counts his pedigree as dung. I think dung is the word the authorized version uses. To count it but dung. It's a stumbling block to me. What, in what way was his pedigree his stumbling, a stumbling block? Uh, well, says uh, Hawthorne in his commentary, he says, they made him self-reliant, self-satisfied, content to offer God his own goodness. Look at me. Look at me. It's a phrase from an Australian television series. Look at me. Look at me. Are we, are we so satisfied with ourselves? Is that what we are pursuing? Do we want to be satisfied? No. We, 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 uh, we fall short every time. If we think we're good enough, we've misunderstood the message of the gospel. We have fallen so far short that Christ had to come to gather us and to clothe us uh, with uh, his own righteousness, his own perfection, and provide forgiveness for us. So we're get, being gathered by Christ. And this is where we need to be careful because what we're being pointed to is a priceless experience. The grace and the wonder of the love of God is beyond words. I said last week it needs the lyricism of song, it needs music, it needs uh, joy, it needs our imaginations extended. Um, but here I am, and I'm going to try and put it in some words. He expressed a similar awe in his letter to the Galatians, uh, possibly uh, mo most likely written earlier than the Philippian letter. To the Galatians, he says in chapter 2, verse 20, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Now that's a personal experience he's talking about. So when Paul's talking about what I'm calling a priceless experience now, he's talking about knowing Christ, not just knowing about him. Um, Alexander McLaren says this, it's no mere theoretical or intellectual knowledge which is intended. It's not something in your mind. Such knowledge wouldn't need any kind of surrender. You can know about Christ without surrendering anything, without suffering the loss of all things. 
Now, another more contemporary scholar, Jim Packer, a renowned, uh, humble Christian man, uh, says we must learn to measure ourselves, not by our knowledge about God, or, nor by our gifts and responsibilities in the church, but by how we pray and by what goes on in our hearts. By how we pray and what goes on in our hearts. This is an experiential thing. Fans know about uh, and may join. Uh, for some years I subscribed to a, a fan magazine. And uh, you know, you think you know about something if you get that kind of news. But in fact, you don't really know the people uh, whom you're fans. You know about them, but you don't know them. And sometimes they let you down. And uh, uh, the difference between being a fan and knowing about or being personally know in knowledge of someone are totally different. And we need to be really careful, I think, here because even in the church, it's possible to know about each other, but not to know each other. We need to think about that, I think. So the former, knowing about Christ, is a great privilege. Uh, but knowing Christ personally is priceless. So do we know Christ? Well, it's not until we start to engage personally with him in our prayers, finding about him, uh, but him himself coming to us in the scriptures, learning of his love for us and relaxing into that. So Jim Packer then says, it, we must measure ourselves by how we pray and what goes on in our hearts. There's a famous saying uh, by an anonymous Scots lady and she was asked about the love of Christ. What do you know about the love of Christ? And her reply was, I can, it's better felt than telt. So my words won't capture it, but if your heart is open to it, you'll discover your heart can be strangely warmed. As Charles, uh, I was I'm getting mixed up now between Charles Spurgeon and John Wesley conversions. So, the pursuit of Christ then. How do we pursue Christ? And this is in particular where the, the, the energy and the discipline of the athlete is brought into the, the narrative. He says, I want to know Christ and experience the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings and become like him in his death, to be identified with Christ. Throughout all his letters, he talks about being in Christ. That's our security. It's not a building in which we worship but it is a person in whom we appear before the Father, someone we can call our elder brother, someone who has loved us as a family member. And here Paul says we have to press on. The pursuit of Christ is not something we have already achieved. We're not there yet. The, uh, mu there is much to be done. There are colossal gains, don't get me wrong. I believe that the Christian church has brought massive blessings to our planet. The message about Jesus as it has moved around the planet has uh, liberated people in, in all kinds of ways. And it, it was when I read um, uh, Don Holland, Tim. Isn't that terrible? Tom Holland's book when I read Tom Holland's book, Dominion, a couple of years ago, uh, I suddenly write, here's a man who doesn't claim to be a Christian, but he's, he's asking the question, how did it come about that the crucified, one crucified person from 2,000 years ago dominated the Western world and the Western way of thinking? And if you read his book, as, as I was uh, pleased to do early on, uh, in the lockdown, or maybe even before. It was, it was 2019 I read it. If you read his book, you'll see the many things that have come to us as a result of Jesus Christ being honoured and pursued and followed. And, uh, but at the same time, there's a downside. There's a dark side. There's always something there corrupting what's going on. We know about this from the institutional uh, report on 
the response to the abuse of children, for example, in Australia a few years ago. We're aware uh, that the church has a dark side. Um, Tom, uh, John, John Dixon, in his recent book, Bullies and Saints, a book which was uh, launched this year, uh, he, he talks about it as well. The idea that the church is in some ways uh, better than we ever imagined, but, it, but there is a dark side that has pursued the Christian church. We need to press forward. Bullies and Saints is subtitled An Honest Look at the Good and Evil in Christian History. You know, the, I was shocked to discover that back in the 1930s in Arnhem Land, there was a Presbyterian man in charge of a mission up there, and he chained people to a tree as punishment. And he was known to fire a gun in the air to intimidate people. This was on a Christian mission run by a Presbyterian superintendent. You can read about it in the writings I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't say who, the, who it is because as soon as I say it, the name is in danger of flying. In the writings of Donald Thompson, who became professor of anthropology at Melbourne University, he speaks about this. And it had a massive negative effect on Donald Thompson, who loved the people of Arnhem Land and uh, went to serve them. So in terms of what the vision of the gospel holds before us, we're not there yet. We need to be very much aware of that. We need to think about, imagine the games, says the Apostle Paul. This is our third point. Think of the races. So we think of the races. Think about this image. Think about this particular image, which is of uh, uh, Ma Madison uh, de Rosario. I should remember the de Rosario name. There's a violin teacher at uh, my old school by the name of de Rosario. So here is Madison de Rosario. I don't know if she's any relation at all, but she's crossing the finish line in the marathon, the T54 marathon. She has those category of disabilities which put her in this race. It was 11, 1 hour, 38 minutes and 11 seconds. That was the time, her time. Can you imagine racing in a wheelchair that long and winning by one second? One second from her colleague and... Uh, and friend and, uh, and uh, opponent, really, uh, Switzerland's Manuela Scher, I suppose. So this was a great image. It was photographed by Eugene uh, Hoshiko, and it was, uh, Mad uh, it was uh, Di Rosario that got on to the, uh, the gold medal podium. But what I really liked about it, and I'm not sure you can pick this up on the screen, but I encourage you to look for the photo. You'll see that uh, uh, the, the Swiss uh, Manuela Scher has got a great smile on her face. She's coming second, and she's so happy. And, and, and I've, I've noticed this in the, in the uh, Paralympic Games in particular, that the, uh, though their opponents in the, in the water or on the field or wherever they're competing, they, they love one another. There would be no race if they didn't have opponents. They need each other and they identify with one another all the more because of what they've been through to be there. And what Paul is saying to us is consider the training of the athlete. What discipline might this mean for us? Well, I'm suggesting, for example, certain disciplines about our Bibles and prayer. How well do we know the Word of God? Do we let the Scriptures speak to us? Do we hear what God the Lord would speak? Does it shape us? And, and does it change our aspirations as we come in prayer to ask that we might be those people that God is working with, that we might be as Christ to others, that we might minister in his name, that we might have that kind of interaction in our lives that brings healing like Jesus did, that brings health, that brings hope and encouragement. This means, of course, when it comes down to it, it's going to affect our time and our money. How do we view that? Do we have that in a separate category? Or do we see that as part of our Christian discipline? The way we manage our money, the way we manage our time, is it 
serving the aims of the kingdom? Is it helping us to know Christ even better? He was wanting that resurrection life. He was pressing forward for it. I want to share an incident that uh, you may, you possibly not heard of, although I've mentioned it once or twice before in other contexts. I want to mention uh, an American politician. He was a senator from North Carolina. His name was Jesse Helms. He was a Republican. He was Christian, a long-term friend of Billy Graham. I dare to say he was racist. Uh, he expressed things that uh, he probably changed his mind on. And I'm going to tell you about something on which he did change his mind on. But quite apart from him, I want to mention a rock star called Bono. Uh, because around Jesse Helms in the Senate, he had younger, a younger generation of people who knew about Bono and said to him, you ought to talk to Bono. And he didn't know who Bono was. But he got his assistance, his uh, younger, younger uh, can't get the right word for it, but uh, those younger people that helped by politicians and so on, his staffers, to arrange a meeting. And they arranged the meeting. And they got together, uh, Bono and Jesse Helms. Now, what was the result of a two-hour conversation in the year 2000? Jesse Helms at that time believed that AIDS was God's judgment on homosexuality. Bono believed that children dying of AIDS in Africa was a tragedy that needed to be averted and that help could be given using antiretroviral drugs. They were together for two hours and at the result of that two hours, as a result of that two hour conversation, Jesse Helms repented of his attitude to uh, the gay homosexual lobby. He, he could see now that he, he couldn't just rat, dismiss it as a result, AIDS as a result of God's judgment on them. And he identified Bono as a Christian brother and he redirected 500 million US dollars of aid to Africa for antiretroviral drugs for AIDS victims. See, Bono was pursuing a vision that he believed that God had given him. The band traveled with their chaplain. Another time, of course, he wanted to talk to Eugene Peterson and Eugene Peterson couldn't make it. He'd never heard of Bono either. He said he was too busy translating Isaiah. But later on, Bono and Eugene Peterson got together. You can see that interview on YouTube if you look it up. So there's much to be done. There's a long way to go. And as we press on in this, I want to suggest to you that there's a surprise in store. And the surprise is this, that you and I have been prized by Christ. We are his prize. We are pursuing him, but he wants to hold us. You get this in verse 12. I keep striving for the prize for which Christ Jesus has already won me. Think about this. We are prized by the Lord Jesus and by love of the Father for his sake. You know, Job gives us a hint of this in probably what is the oldest book in the Bible. Job says, if a man dies, shall he live again? You know, if, if I'm down in the earth. And he has this moment where he imagines that thinking of God and he says, you will long for the work of your hands. What a beautiful insight that is, that God will long for the work of his hands. And Hebrews brings this full circle. In chapter 2, verse 11 through 13, it says, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. As he says to the Father, here I am with the children God has given me. From Deuteronomy chapter 33, right back in the Pentateuch, all the way through Malachi, the people of God are called his treasured possession. And you see, God has come down in Christ to redeem a people. And as we open our hearts to him, he gathers us as his prize. And he has a purpose for us. But let us not forsake that. Let us pursue it. You know, a beautiful children's hymn, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so.
perhaps that says it all. I'm going to invite uh, I'm going to invite Amanda to come forward and play for us, and uh, invite you to just think about these words, this pursuit of Christ that is our challenge. May God bless us as we do so. Thank you, Amanda.
Thank you, Amanda. Now shall we come before God with our prayers. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Lord God, we do not presume to come before you in any righteousness or merit of our own, but only in the beauty of Jesus, our Saviour and King. Please draw near to us as we seek to come close to you. We are, acknowledge that, that we are not the spiritual force for good that we should be. Eradicate our sloth and the spirit, spiritual lethargy that so easily enervates us and awaken us today with a hunger and a thirst for the Lord Jesus. Like athletes preparing for the games, quicken and guide us as we seek to know you better. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the benefits you have given us in your Son, Jesus, our most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, and for all the pains and ill insults he has borne for us. And we pray that with riches of Chichester, we may see Christ more clearly, love him more dearly, and follow him more nearly, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Thank you for the joy that is so freely offered in the gospel of your love and grace. Help us by your spirit to know now that you rejoice in mercy and are near to bless and you will not withhold from us any good and needful thing. On this anniversary weekend of the 9-11 attacks, we thank you for the courage of so many people involved in helping others in the face of tragic loss, suffering and death. Give us wisdom in the face of terrorism and facilitate the reign of the Prince of Peace among the nations. We remember the Afghan refugees settling now into new countries. May they quickly feel safe and settle well. Help diplomats to find ways to assist their relatives and friends still at risk in Afghanistan. In a world flooded with displaced persons and refugees, seeking asylum. We think of Ludwig Gutmann as we remember the millions who have fled Syria and other places. And we ask for blessing wherever the poor and disadvantaged are sheltered and helped. Guide us as a nation to gracious and godly concern for the stranger. We pray for our nation too as we cope with the pandemic Guide our leaders with the necessary wise counsel and advice to open up at a rate that protects the people and gives attention to the need for social engagement and economic recovery. In the family of nations, we ask for similar wisdom to prevail, that vaccines will reach the needed high percentages of the poorer nations. Forgive us that the expenditure on weapons is so vastly in excess of the money spent on education, health and agriculture put together. We remember frail elderly and sick friends this morning and commit them to you in the silence of our hearts. We think of those who we worshipped with in this place. We think of those in aged care facilities, care homes. We think of those we carry in our hearts day by day. Help them cast their care on you and to know that you are with them. We ask in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Can I remind you as we finish that the, the leaflet and the notes for Christine's talk are available on the church's website. You feel free to download them if you want to review anything that you've heard today. And uh, our prayer is that the Lord will be close to you, closer than you realize, and that you'll know his presence in your life in the week ahead. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all you carry in your hearts. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen.